and I'm here with a couple of pretty awesome guests who are here to talk about customer success. So, um, so our speakers today come from a nice mix of different verticals, but they all share the same passion for customer success. So let's take a minute for everyone to introduce themselves with their name, their company title, and their favorite band. Who wants to go first? Don't, don't all jump up at once now. <laughs> Chad, why don't we start with you? Sure. So my name is Chad Hornfeld. I'm the Director of Customer Operations at uh, Inclusive, um, and I'm a uh, fan of classic rock, so I like the police. Cool. Uh, my name is Gany Orpaz. I'm the founder of Tutango, and my favorite band is Led Zeppelin, of course. Hi there. Uh, this is John Hurstein. I'm Senior Vice President of Customer Success at Box, and uh, older than the average boxer, so would be probably you two for me. I'm Michael Blaisdell. I've got several hats. I'm an analyst and a consultant and a writer the Hotline Magazine and, and the new Customer Success Association. As far as the favorite band, well, everything from, from uh, Celtic Woman to classical to rock, anything and everything. All right, I'm uh, Ronnie Felcher. I'm Director of uh, Customer Success at Clarison. Uh, and I'm a grunge guy, so my favorite band is Alice in Chains. Yeah. Very cool. All right, so now that we've all got a kind of a little feel for your personalities, Let's just dive straight into this conversation about customer success, starting with, how do you define customer success? Who wants to take this one first? So I, I, I could take a, a shot at it. I mean, at, at Box, we've got a pretty broad definition of customer success from an organizational perspective. Um, we basically include all of our post-sale services into that, uh, under that umbrella. So for us, it's implementation services, which we call professional services, um, support, customer success managers, and um, operations. That's pretty true across the industry. There's there's a thousand different definitions for it and different sub pieces to the role. Um, I think that one of the, the, the few constants in the customer success game is that there is no standard definition for it yet. Yeah, um, I, would, I would agree on that front. I think that um, here in Intuitive, um, we look at, it's kind of part of our core values. We kind of look at our, our everyone that's it, everyone's in customer success. If you're on the PM team, the product management team, trying to understand what the customer wants, um, you know, from our sales team, we're trying to you know make sure that we pair up the right solution. Uh, but you know, specifically on the customer success group, um, I think similar to John and what we, the, happens at Box is everything kind of on the post sale side, so on onboarding um, and just ongoing um, relationship building with our customers. And really, it's all about what are their goals and making sure. Are um, we're in marketing, so it's really making sure in terms of their marketing, they're in line. Yeah, and, uh, for us, um, I can say that for Clarus and customer success, is, uh, it's, I think it's uh, it's similar to uh, to Box a little bit. Um, um, but we, we basically we do we do everything. Uh, we uh, do the onboarding. Um, we also do support ourselves. We do training. Uh, we're starting to help, you know, head out to having a professional services department, but we're still doing a lot of the consulting and, and implementation and helping with integration to everything that's related. Uh, so, yeah, for us, it's a very broad definition. Yeah, one thing that I would add is that customer success is, uh, I guess, all the activities that drive value to customers and uh, not to forget that within SaaS, it's also about the product. So, everything that we do from the product, the um, the processes and you know communication uh, with customers that eventually drives successful customer uh, outcome. Great. So, um, what are some ways that you would measure customer success? Because right now the whole topic about uh, for this hangout is customer success metrics. So let's talk about what are some ways that you measure it. Chad, would you like to start with this one too? Sorry, is that is that to me? Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. right, sure. Um, so I think that there are you know some of the, the foundational things. So you know um, renewal rates. So that's like a, I would say a foundational part. Um, another one that we look at here is uh, net churn. Um, so that's you know the the dollars that are coming in on the on the you know on the on the customer side versus those that are um, that you're losing. And so when and when I say those two as sort of foundational items, 
Um, those are, um, you know, those are our core and they're key to kind of what we do. Um, there's no kind of commission around that, but those are very key elements that we measure ourselves. I think the third one that is very important here is how, what are our, our customers doing in terms of advocacy? So are our customers going out and helping and referring customers to us? Are they doing reference calls for us? Um, measure the type of advocacy activities that our customers are doing, and we, and we measure our customer success too based on that. I think across the industry, most of the, the, the people tend to look at revenue first and foremost. I know the senior management team certainly do, and the boards of directors that oversee the game focus in on revenue, and it's increasing to you know, what, how, the level of attention they pay to it, because at the end of the day, that's what's going to matter in your, um, in your overall company valuation and in your, your growth rate and your, your overall success. Yeah, so I, I think, um, you know, for us, we, we do all the things that sort of Chad talked about. Um, we also look at things like what we call CS identified upsell. So if we're, if we're identifying opportunities within our existing account that are coming from the success team, um, you know, we like to kind of show that sort of like an influencer type of a number. Um, and then, again, because of what we're covering a number of different services, the metrics we look at for support are very different than the metrics we look at for our implementation team or our CSMs. Um, but at the end of the day, we're all shooting towards the same thing, which is the highest possible retention. Yeah. John, could yeah. you? Oh. Uh, no, I was going. Yeah. I was just going to ask you, John, if you could elaborate a little bit, because you had just mentioned, you know, you use different metrics for support and versus the other business side. Um, could you give some examples of things like? Is it would it be like net promoter score? Is that what you would base it on? Um, the success of the customers, like. What could you give like more concrete examples? Sure. Yeah. I mean, in, in support, it's kind of typical stuff. Although one thing that we're really careful about at Box is we, we, we tend to not think about support as in terms of call center, you know, standard call center metrics. So we actually don't think that people call full time, average call times. It's much more about um, ticket volumes and satisfaction on those tickets. We do look at response times and resolution times. Um, so so fairly standard stuff, but we're, we're definitely staying away from the, the idea that. Support is a call center function. Um, it's more about a customer service function, um, and I think our metrics support that. But we look really, really carefully at those metrics. We're, we do weekly kind of updates around, um, in particular, support so because the volumes are so big. Um, you tend to see trends there. If we do a, a promotion around a, a, a free campaign or something, we'll see a spike in tickets that will have a, um, you know, an impact on, on downstream satisfaction if we're not able to get to the tickets fast enough. So we do a lot of that that sort of work on support. Um, professional services is more around implementation metrics, right? So how many hours are we spending per project? How long is it taking us from beginning to end? Um, uh, satisfaction on the projects and, and so forth. And then with, um, with the CSM function, it's probably the least metric-driven part of what we do because it's very much about the ongoing relationship as opposed to specific and concrete events. Um, but we do a customer SAT survey uh, for CSMs. We do look at churn, and um, uh, the primary metric really for CSMs is ongoing adoption of the product. So we look at you know seat level usage, seat creation, those those kind of metrics. Cool, Guy, you were going to say something? <laughs> yeah, I think I've, um, I'm trying to. Uh, 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 um, sorry, I'm, I'm trying to say that uh, the, I would differentiate uh, the the outcome of the process, right? Which is obviously churn. Upsell and uh, and add-on sales versus the the metrics that you know if, if a customer success person needs to be measured and compensated on on an ongoing basis, what are the measures there? And I think John said rightfully that it's hard to measure. And I think there as well, uh, you know, looking at how the customers under this customer success rep are actually seeing value from the product based on adoption and. Depth of uh, engagement with uh, with the product is definitely a good indicator into what this uh, CSM person is doing a good job or, or not. Okay, so it seems like a lot of the um, metrics that have been brought up as examples, um, like uh, it seems like there are, some of them are lagging indicators. For example, churn. That's not something you really get to see early on. So what are some leading indicators to customer success that you could share with our viewers that maybe you guys might have 
uh, implemented in your customer success processes currently. Are you talking about leading indicators for churn, like uh, early detection of at-risk customers? Um, yeah, definitely. The, the, those would be metrics that would uh, determine, you know, where the customer is in their life cycle. So yeah, if you have anything to add to that, I would love to hear what are some of those leading indicators. Well, there's a lot going on with that. I've been talking to some companies that have zeroed in on use of, uh, they'll have a suite of applications and they know that if a given customer is using a particular module of that suite, that their chances for renewal are up to 60, 70 percent higher than, than they would be if they weren't using that mo particular module. And some have even gone, you know, zeroed in further to looking at a specific feature of the application that if they're using that, then there's a, a better chance or if their, their use of that, you know, reverse drops off, then they're significantly at risk. Changes in personnel or others, there's a whole raft of them, but you have to tailor them to your particular market and, and your particular product. Um, yeah, I think this, this that, oh, sorry, it's, it's, it's say that this is sort of the blessing the curse of SaaS. I mean, there, there's no shortage of data around what users are doing. Um, the question is which of those things matter. So if you look at Box, which is a relatively simple application, I actually came from NetSuite before, it's a very complex ERP. Box compared to that is fairly simple, but even within Box, we have various features, and the question is, is the use of particular features relevant in terms of whether the customer stays with you or not? Um, and, and sort of sorting through all that and understanding that, you know, uploads, downloads, previews, collaboration, share, shared ones, all that sort of stuff um, is, is all about engagement. Which of those things actually matter at the end of the day when the customer is deciding, deciding whether to renew it? Um, yeah. Yeah, John, I have a question for you, uh, kind of just to, to try, try to understand. So basically, Usage is monitors the the value of the customer, right? It kind of looks at the, the at the success from the customer's perspective, from the user's perspective. So, would you attribute that to the customer success manager that owns this customer, or are there different metrics for the customer success managers themselves? Um, so, I, we're not entirely responsible for it in the sense that you know there's also I, I think someone mentioned earlier the product is a huge part of this, right? And the extent to which a user uses a feature or set of features, um, it depends a lot on whether the features are useful, whether they're easy to get to, whether they're easy to understand, et cetera. Um, and my team doesn't have real direct influence over that. But for part of what we try to do is take feedback from our customers and, and sort of roll it back into the product team, right? So we're sort of consumers of the product and we're sort of downstream of that, but we can also influence it by bringing that feedback back. And we call that voice to the customer. Um, so the way we measure success of, of, of our folks particularly CSMs, is around how much they're able to influence adoption, you know, big picture. So we talk about things like use cases, right? If you get above the features, you start talking about why did someone purchase the product, what, are they, what business value are they trying to get out of it, and how do they intend to use it, that's what my team needs to under, understand and make sure that we're working directly with the customer on ensuring that they're getting the value they thought they were getting. And that, that rises above the level of individual features. Yeah, I, you know, on, on our end here, I mean, we kind of almost skip over adoption in some ways. I mean, it, it is something that we stress, but our thinking here is that if our customers are adopting our product and using it effectively, then they'll advocate for us. So if we put a metric that's like a broader metric around advocacy of our customers, um, then our CSMs will push our customers to adopt our products to, you know, to be satisfied in what they're doing and then, um, you know, spread the word and spread that message. But Chad, Chad, isn't this saying that basically you cannot measure the customer success team's impact? Meaning that churn and, and upsell are lagging indicators, advocacy and usage are kind of how, how the CSM, how the customers are actually, you know, what they do. You measure what the customers do, mm -hmm. and it's hard. And, and how do you attribute the influence of your customer success processes and the customer success team to the outcome? That's that's a question that I'm kind of uh, trying to understand. So I've, I've had that, I mean, you know, prior to Influ when I was Eloqua, and one of the things that I had set up was a way of tracking our activities and doing that in a unified way. So typically what I like to do is I like to group activities into a project of some sort. So a project could be an onboarding project. It could be a special type of project that we're doing with that customer. Maybe it's a success planning project where we're trying to understand what they're trying to do and, 
and then help them on that path. Um, you know, or it could be an ongoing project, again, ongoing meetings. So we, we group those together and then we log activities against those. So what I'm able to do is I'm able to say, these are the customers that I have been influencing, this is what I've done, and then this is the impact. Because I 100% agree with you, if you don't have a tracking mechanism in place, then, then you know, demonstrating that influence is very difficult. <clears throat> yeah, um, yeah, Ronnie. That on was our just end, I mean, we're we're very um, you know we're obviously uh, tracking usage. That's very important for us. It's uh, I mean that's that's the basics. Uh, but we've also learned that sometimes it's not enough uh, just to track the usage itself. And also by the time the usage drops might be too late. Uh, we're in the process of redefining um, the, you know the way we look at at this and and are moving to uh, towards a. Uh, Tracking value more than just usage. So basically, we, we, we're in the process of thinking: what what values do our our customers get from our product? Uh, listing them out, trying to understand you know what what are the uh, success criteria for them? Why do they choose to use our product? And then having all those values listed, the next step is to track those and, and see if our customers are 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 getting to uh, to to uh, gain those values from from the tool. Um, and you know this is the only way to go when you when you need to track uh, you know large numbers of customers who are in the hundreds or thousands. You need to have a, a, a sort of a mechanism in there that uh, tracks the real value that customers get. Um, and when you know based on our formulas that we were put, putting in our, our our systems and our CRM and our uh, tracking tools, we'll be able to to um, uh, in real time uh, reach out those customers whether it's you know it's a phone call or send them some uh, um, uh, training material or marketing material and try to get them back to, you know, on, on the right journey and, and uh, getting towards getting those values from the tool. So that's kind of what we're working on right, right now. So in your experience, since I'm pretty sure a lot of our viewers are also from online SaaS companies, uh, from your experience, are there any lag-worthy customer events within the customer lifecycle that you feel like DSM should focus on, whether it's specific to your vertical or if you just have, you know, these are some things that you really should look out for during the life cycle. Because like you said, you're already tracking for usage. By the time you realize there's a drop in an activity, it might be too late. So what are maybe some other events that maybe they should be looking out for? Yeah, I think we're first time with the, with the onboarding phase and, and making sure that the onboarding phase completes uh, successfully and gets the, the customers are getting their first value um, out of the, the tool. So because of the first quick win, uh, that's a, a big thing for us. Um, if they're not getting there, then, then we're at, at risk, um, and there's a big red flag on that. Um, afterwards, after getting that first value, we're looking into growing that and getting additional values. So there's sort of a journey here that we're, uh, we're you know, tracking and making sure we hit the right points. Um, and of course, there are other types of alerts. I mean, we, we all know about you know, campaigns leaving, et cetera. Um, for now, we, we, we want to focus on, on the ones that we do have control over, um, and that's getting the customers up the learning curve, uh, getting to use all, all the different features, and, and, and getting all those quick wins that would get them to, to uh, you know, continue their, their, their journey and go towards uh, growing that and, and seeing more value from the tool. So, so, sorry, just to kind of add on this a bit more, what are the critical events within the customer lifecycle you're currently tracking. Oh, sorry, lights off here. <laughs> move a little bit. Maybe I can, I can jump in. So Ronnie referred to, um, you know, an admin change as an, as an example. Um, you know, that is one we, we actually key on because for us it means that, you know, there's someone new in, in the frame that we may not have had any exposure to and that may or may not be a risk to us, right? Um, in, what, what we see is that you know, first of all, we have a range of customers everywhere from three seat business accounts all the way up to, to tens of thousands of seats. Um, an admin change in a small account could be really significant because likely that was the person who was involved in the purchasing decision, it's probably an executive, an executive sponsor, and they'll probably be involved in the renewal discussion. So we want to fairly quickly get engaged with that new admin and understand what's their perspective on Box, you know, does, does he or she understand what the use cases are, what the value is, and so forth, get them trained if needed on the admin. Etc. So that's really important. Now, 
in larger accounts, I think the individual admin is a little bit less important than the overall business sponsor or executive sponsor. And one challenge we have is we don't actually know necessarily from a system perspective who, who that is. So we, we can't automate triggers that tell us the CIO of this company just left, right? We, we don't have that capability. Today. There's a couple of companies I'm working with that have looked even earlier in the process and they look at the sales cycle itself and there are certain steps that the, the prospective customer either takes or doesn't take which increase or decrease the assessed churn risk of them. And what they've done is basically is, is look at the data they've got for the pattern of their ideal customers and they notice the variances as early as possible. And in one particular company, they have a weekly deal review meeting where the salespeople and the success people go over the prospective deals and assess them for how well they fit their model. And when they don't fit as well, then they work together to say, well, let's encourage this customer, for example, to commit to a, lo a longer initial contract phase because that's an indicator that they're more likely to, to hang around longer. But that pattern matching, I think, is going to be a key aspect so that at every step of the customer life cycle, if a given customer doesn't match the desired pattern, um, you need to figure out, of course, is this sig you know, significant for this particular customer but it's definitely a warning sign to take to to take into consideration and to keep your finger on the pulse to watch for. Yeah, I think that's a great point, and it sounds like almost nirvana to have the customer success team part of the, the deal process. Um, that happens for us occasionally, but but not for every deal. And you know, obviously, the sooner you can identify risk, and we're getting to the point where um, you know, within a week or two of a new account, we can identify if there's risk in the account based on kind of our initial discussion with the customer. The sooner you identify that risk, even if it's in the pre-sales process. The, the sooner you can sort of manage expectations and work, work through that. Yeah, the customer, I'm, the, the client I'm thinking of actually has veto authority. If yeah. it doesn't match, if they're not willing to take on the responsibility for monitoring the success of that particular account, they can veto it and it will not close. Awesome. That's pretty cool. And I would agree, that does sound like nirvana, and I think that everybody would agree, if, wow, if I could have that. Yeah. It's I nirvana mean, for two reasons, I guess. One is that they can afford to... Uh, <laughs> Yeah. Of customers. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it is a tough spot to be in if you're a customer success role to say, I don't think we should proceed with the deal. And you'd want to do that, you know, very, very rarely, and you'd want to have really, really solid data for why you're why you're suggesting that. But to, to be in a position where you're at the table at that point in the deal is, is pretty cool. Well, they've got the data, and the most important thing is, is they have to do it. Because if you consider that your customer acquisition cost can be, you know, can take you 12 months or even longer in some cases to recoup, if that customer leaves before that customer acquisition cost has been recouped, you instantly have a dead loss to the company. So it's loss prevention, and that's the clout behind that that um, that veto authority is is that it's tied to the revenue of the company. Yeah, yeah, and on, on my end, so I I sit on our pipeline meetings and. Um, you know, I have limited resources like everybody does. And so it's very important that I know what's coming down and where I'm going to need to put my resources um, to make the biggest impact. So it's, I think if you handle the onboarding process and customer success, you need to be part of those pipeline meetings. Yeah, when I was at a uh, discussion with some people who manage their customer success group, there was, um, during one of the panels, the the person who was in charge of customer success, they not only made sure that customer success was a part of the discussions for sales uh, when they're trying to close a deal. So it's not like we hand you off from sales over to customer success and that's that. There's always some sort of interlinking relationship between the two. And I've noticed when I've spoken to other customer success professionals, that's kind of something that they would like to see more of. And speaking of you know measuring performance, Let's talk beyond just processes of, you know, what are the metrics that we measure to understand usage or, you know, how likely are they to churn. Um, let's talk about the people that you work with. So I'm sure you guys all had a really excellent team of customer success managers. Um, I'm, I'm sure a lot of people out there are very interested in knowing, you know, okay, well, how do I compensate for customer success managers? So maybe you guys can share, you know, how are your... CSM's performance is being measured, and subsequently, you know, how is their compensation being reflected?
reflected in these metrics. We're, we're lucky at Box we have an all-volunteer crew because everyone believes so passionately in our mission. <laughs> <laughs> Um, right. We're a startup here, so it's all uh, stock options. Uh. <laughs> um, now, yeah. for, for us, we have a, um, uh, a relatively lightly leveraged plan for our, for our CSM, so the majority of their comp is in base. We, we don't incent these guys to go sell, um, to even, even to upsell. We do, we do compensate them a bit for identifying upsell opportunities, but we don't want them to get into a mode where they're mainly motivated by selling new seats. Um, Yeah, there's a, there's a danger that I think everybody recognizes about incenting the wrong behaviors. And if you try to directly commission them on sales, you may be encouraging them to focus only on the sales. Another approach I've seen is, again, going back to the pattern matching, one of the, the metrics is being used of, of how many of your customers have you moved up the, um, you know, are you fitting the pattern with and moving them up the, uh, the value scale. So in essence, what you're focusing on is the value that the customer is getting from use, and that's reflected back in the performance evaluation of the CSM. So, uh, Michael, so what is the performance? I mean, how do you measure the performance of the CSM? I think, uh, you know, if I tie it back to things that we've said in the beginning of this uh, panel, it seems like it's almost impossible to measure the performance of uh, the customer success person as, the, um, as it's all about the outcome, right? It's either the business outcome or the usage and adoption and, and value outcome, which is hard to correlate with the customer success team. I mean, there are many factors. And this will go later on into how can you, how can you justify the, the budget for, this, uh, for, this, for these activities, right? I mean, how can you upfront justify the, you know, the investment in, in customer success? That's kind of... So, so I'm trying to summarize what I'm asking. What could be a good uh, metrics about the performance of the customer success team uh, to learn about? Well, there's a range of things, and you do have to, to customize them. I mean, the example I use is, is kind of like you know, the old-fashioned Swiss watch, where there's lots of little wheels and dials that can have different effect on the operation of, of the watch. And you, know, you, you aren't going to get a one-size-fits-all metric because the different business communities the, you know, between the prosumer market, the small business market, the, the, the medium business, the, the enterprise level, and the type of the product are going to all have heavy effects on this. So yes, compensation is going, you know, and, and, and performance incent incentives are going to be a very rough challenge to work on and, and it, there's Typically, the, the people I've been talking to and working with, they start with one, they let it run for six months to, to test the effects, then they start with another, you know, that they, they change it to, to adjust for different factors. Um, it's a moving target as your, your, your business and your, the businesses of your customers grow. But one of the things you can do is if you have a quarterly review meeting with your clients and you agree upon certain goals that they're value-related for the customer, and if those goals are achieved, then obviously the customer is getting value. And if the, the CSM rep has helped achieve those, that's something you want to encourage. But again, you're going to have to have the data, and you're going to have to do some serious design work to make this fit and make it be fair and adjust it where it's not. I, I just think that uh, I agree with that, but it's very hard, meaning that if I measure sales, then it's the number of deals that they close or the, the amount of revenue that they close. It's simple, measurable performance metric. What's the equivalent in customer success? Yeah, I don't think you're going to get an equivalent for customer success, unfortunately. I mean, uh, John earlier talked about measuring what the, the people in support do, and, and, and he was saying that he didn't want to have it be like a, a, a call center support. Well, I've got 30 years of experience in that, and I know that, for example, if you want to measure, um, if, you, if you set as, as a single metric, like number of cases closed, you'll get a lot of cases closed. Now, whether they're actually resolved or not, that's a different issue. And if you don't test for that, um, you'll get very unfortunate results. I have seen that too many times. 
So I think it, I don't think we're going to have one metric. I think we're going to have a host of them that the weighting of the factors is going to be adjusted, you know, in, in, in very carefully. But the one thing that we, we do know is, is this guy says, it's hard and it's going to be hard. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and just to, to go back to your point, Ryan, I mean, if I, if, again, like if I'm not tracking those specific things, like for example, we do success planning and things like those, if, I, if I'm not tracking that, I'm just basically saying, yeah, we're doing that stuff. There's no way I can justify our costs and kind of what we do here. But if I'm tracking those activities and I can relate them back and show that there's a higher renewal rate for those customers that we do have those specific activities for, then I definitely have a cause of justification for our costs. And then you can flip it around and you could say, well, what if we remove these resources? What will, you know, what will that impact be on our, on our renewal base um, and, you know, on our upsell potential? So, you know, I think those are different way, definitely things that you can, and tactics that you can use as well. Um, so as an example, um, I looked at, at one segment and said, hey, we're losing X amount from a renewal perspective. If I add an additional resource, I will, you know, enhance that renewal rate by X. And, you know, if you let me try that, I will demonstrate what I can do. And so I was able to do that and I was able to justify the resources. So, I mean, you have to have forward thinking executives as well um, and people that are going to buy into customer success. Um, I'm lucky I've, I've had those in my career, uh, but you also, of course, have to justify it too. So sorry, I, uh, I dropped off there. I, I'm not sure what happened, but um, it, it's an interesting point, Chad, because it's one of these I actually struggle with a little bit. I think we, we have the right philosophy around that, which is like, hey, if you can demonstrate that, then we're, we're happy to add resources to, to address those things. But the hard part is how do I prove it? So a big question for us has been, what's the right ratio of CSMs to account, right? And if, if it's X, and I'm saying, well, if it was you know X uh, minus 10 or X minus 20, um, I believe that will result in better adoption, better retention, et cetera. How do I prove that, right? When there's so many factors that go into churn, it's very, I found it very difficult with that, with that size data set to prove that if I had half as many accounts or, or three quarters as many accounts, I wouldn't prove the outcomes. So interesting, any, anyone's thoughts on that? I, I guess a tactical answer could be, you know, cohorts, meaning uh, trying to segment uh, customers based on various, uh, um, I would say, trying to create a baseline of customers that all joined at the same time from the same tier for the same product. But this is a luxury, I guess, that only uh, kind of very mature companies that have a lot of customers could do. So, you know, every other company could do a little bit less than that. But uh, but I think as a... As a you know, as people that are involved in the customer success, we don't have the luxury not to prove the value of customer success. I know that the early adopters, and I guess all everyone here is part of the early adopter market, um, believes in uh, you know the, in, in the contribution of the customer success process and the customer success organization to the value creation for customers. Right. However, how do you prove that this is still something that I think? needs to be provided, and I think uh, the sooner the better. Um, yeah, another approach that I took, um, you know, at a previous company, we had these awards that we, that we gave to our customers. So I followed the, uh, the Heath brothers, if you guys have read their books, they're you know, obviously really great books. Um, this idea of bright spots, so what are those customers doing that are just, you know, different than others and that makes, makes them more successful? So I looked at those companies that were winning those awards, and then I looked at kind of what was the CSM contributions within those customers. And so it was very apparent that the CSMs were, you know, have, I would say heavily involved, but they were doing certain activities that the CSMs, you know, were, that we have in our toolbox, they were following those activities and that, that made those successful customers. So that helped me as well in terms of trying to justify like, what it was that I need. Um, and I, I know that helped me justify some of the additional tools to help the CSM organization you know, dig further into the metrics that we need. Yeah, that, that, that's, a, that's a very interesting point. Um, for us, um, you know, we, we, we uh, compensate our, our team. We have team goals, not individual goals. And we'll look at, at churn and expansions. We have, uh, you know, we have uh, uh, those targets set by management. And uh, um, based on our, our you know, our uh, 
um, on, on our being able to hit those targets, we get compensated. Of course, there's also the qualitative um, aspect. So um, you know, we do reviews with our with our with our team members, and we're looking for people that are, are you know very um, passionate about the work with the customers, are, are able to think out of the box. We're looking for a lot of dedication from our customer success because it's very hard to measure it um, and get you know numbers. Um, but we, we face the same challenges. When we go to our CFO to justify more resources, then it's very hard to really give a number saying, if I get another resource in customer success, how would that improve our, our retention? Uh, I think we, we just need time to collect all the data uh, and, and then go back and analyze, do a lot of BI and see, you know, what, what, what's, the, what's the percentage we can improve retention and then convert that to dollar amounts over time. Uh, by by just adding more 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 staff, so we're all in the same boat, I guess. So I mean, one interesting thing is uh, you guys have talked about you know trying to prove the value of customer success, and a lot of companies, you know, they talk about kind of promoting customer success in the executive level, right? So they want to get buy-in from the CEO because once they have that, it's hopefully going to trickle down and get through the entire company. But one of the questions that I did see. Um, on another forum, someone had asked, what are some ways to get buy-in for customer success other than the CEO? Like, is there another way to kind of infuse this into the DNA of the company and it doesn't start with the CEO? Do you guys have any thoughts on that? One of your difficulties in that one is that some of the things that are going to have the most maximum effect on, on, on success as a team come down from the CEO level because if you have to you know, if, if, for example, if you're going to have a deal review board, if you're going to bake retention into the compensation plan of the sales reps, you've absolutely got to have CEO level support for that or you're just not going to get anywhere. And I think the key to it is working through the CFO and, and tying it to financial data and then having, I mean, having a lot of data is great and, and you need to have that, but it also has to be analyzed and it has to be used. And there, I think, is where your partnership with the CFO comes in. Is if you can put it in financial terms and have somebody playing what if with your data, but tying it back to financial terms, at the end of the day, that's what's going to count. Hey, Michael, I, I don't know. I think, I think Alice, I know you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think you're just asking, like, how does a CSM kind of influence others in the organization when I get the message out? I don't know if it's necessarily at the C-level, um, but I think that the CSMs hold a lot of power. I know at our organization, we have daily sync-ups uh, across the company. I mean, uh, that's kind of the size and startup that we do here. Um, but one of the things that when, when the CS team, customer success team, um, has their opportunity, we talk about the stories and what our customers are doing. And I think that holds a lot of power um, in terms of the knowledge that we have and how that can be used and how it inputs and, and, and uh, influences other teams. So I think that's something that we don't want to underestimate. Yeah, I think for, for us as well, there's always, you know, there's always the question, who owns the, the account? Is it the CSM or the, the account manager, the salesperson? Um, and, you know, recently uh, when, when someone was asked in our, about a specific account, who owns it, the, the first name that comes up is the CSM because, uh, you know, bottom line is that the CSM really knows that customer, know what, what they're doing, what's their business like, um, and where you know our account managers are in the picture when it comes to the, the renewals and, and and doing you know uh, uh, sales administration etc. But there's one person in, in our in the company that really owns that relationship uh, end to end, and that's the CSM. So uh, for us, it's you know it's it's obvious that if you want to know what's going on, if you want to understand you know the customer or uh, expansion opportunities, advocacy etc., it's it, you have to talk to the customer success for that. So oh, it's interesting. Oh, Go ahead. sorry. I, I was just gonna say it was interesting that you brought up CSMs and account managers. Um, how would you? I mean, to you, CSMs and account managers. I guess from what you just said, they're two different roles. They're in charge of two different things. But a lot of people seem to group, uh, you know, CSMs with account managers or account management. Like, how is this the same thing, or is it something different? In some companies, it is the same thing. The, the, the CSM team owns the, the relationship from start. Once, once it's the original contract is signed, everything after that is a, is a function of the CSM organization. In other companies, it's broken out. There's account managers and there's CSMs. Circling back to Chad's point, 
yes, the data you have and the stories of what's going on with the customer is vital, and that needs to be packaged and marketed. Well, not, well, marketed to engine, you know, to development, to sales, to feed that back into the loop. But at the end of the day, before you can get the organizational changes that are necessary to institute true ownership, effective ownership of the customer, you're talking C-level input and, and support. You can't do that from the CSM level. You can argue for it, but before you get it, you're going to have to have executive um, approval. I think in terms of the um, the, the roles, um, I I found it really important um, to keep the the separation between account managers and CSMs, um, at least the way we kind of run ours. And I, I I like having the credibility with the customer to be able to say to them, um, my team's not compensated based on how much you buy from us, right? My my team is motivated and compensated based on how literally how successful you are. Do you renew with us? Um, you know, are your users actually using the seats that you purchased from us? That's that's how we're motivated. That's how we're compensated. Mm -hmm. um, and I like having that. I think it adds a lot of credibility to the discussion the CSM has with the customer. So the customer doesn't feel like, well, I only really talk to this person when they're trying to get the renewal, you know, transaction done. Right? Yeah, I feel like I'm a, a bobblehead over here because I keep uh, nodding in agreement. Um, and I, I just agree. It's you know definitely keeping those those um, those areas separate. I think it's best for the customer, best for the organization. Um, you know, in our organization, we bring our sales reps back in to help. You know, with the renewals, it's just it's kind of the size of the organization we have. But we still, it's still, you know, it's there's separation there, which I think is good. Yeah, I I personally think that um, the the type of relationship CSM should have with the customer is a relationship of of trust and intimacy. Mm -hmm. And I guess the challenge with high volume ratio of CSM and, and customers is, is, is a challenge there. And technology can help, but it's about uh, being able to kind of uh, the trust is about the customer is trusting, like John said, that uh, you know we are operating on its best interest and intimacy that it has knowledge. I don't think necessarily that this means that you know being intimate does not mean. Uh, they, uh, kind of a one-to-one -one relationship or a day-to-day -day account management. It's being able to uh, help the customer or uh, gain value out of the product uh, on an ongoing basis without the customer feeling that they need to tell the story again and again and again uh, every time they contact the company. Kind of a quick funny story, but um, one of my CSMs told me recently that uh, they were working with a sales rep on an account that had lower adoption than we wanted, and was trying to engage the rep in, in kind of the re, you know re-talking or getting back in touch with the customer to understand you know what the use cases were and so forth. And the rep could not figure out why she was being so relentless about this adoption thing. And he finally said, "Said, is, is this how you get paid or something? Like I just I just don't understand." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is our job. Yes, this is how we get paid. So I think just along those lines, I think if there's a, a metric that can unify both the account management and, and CSM and, and others in the organization, I think that's important. Um, you know, previously uh, we had a metric, it was net MRR. So that's all the dollars that are coming in versus all the dollars that are going out. And I thought that was really helpful because on the CSM side, you're the post-customer side. But if you're helping generate uh, references and advocates and things like that, you're going to help on the pre-sale side as well as if a sales rep asks you to help out and jump on a prospect call, you know, you're gung-ho and you're jumping in there. And it's the same thing on the, on, the, on the CSM side. If you need help of a sales rep, you know, if your field sales reps are, you know, you know in a local city and you need them to go just do some FaceTime, they'll go do that for you. So I think some, some unified metrics across the organization, and that would be a bonus metric of some sort, I think that's important as well. So based on everything that um, the stories that you guys have shared, um, is so would you guys agree that one of the, the key met metrics here for you guys is adoption? It's one of them, yes, but not the only one. What would be some other one that we can just throw out there in the last minute with our viewers? Value from the customer's perspective, value received. Yeah, I mean, going back to my, uh, you know, just in terms of your customers uh, becoming, you know, those 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 big fans for you and, and wanting to go and, and help um, spread the word of your organization to others. That I mean, you can't get a a, a better customer than that. And if you're 
a lot of those, and you're going to grow your business. So that's one of the key things we look at. Cool. Well, thank you all today. We're about to wrap up. Um, we had one question from um, our, one of our viewers, Jeff McKellen. He asked, I think earlier when we were discussing um, customers, the, the metrics that we guys use to measure um, how well a customer is uh, using things or adopting things, um, he says, Chad mentioned a higher level metric that is a combination of other metrics. Could you expand on that? I'm not sure if you can recall that part of your conversation. <laughs> Um, yeah, uh, like a higher level, I mean, there's, you know, obviously the renewals and, and renewal rate and, and, you know, net churn, those are kind of higher up type of uh, metrics. Um, you know, in a previous life, we had a higher up metric. We looked at one key adoption metric, and I, I think I forget who mentioned it, it was John, or, you know, looking at one of those one, of those one key pieces of, of data that's going to tell if your clients are adopting better than not, and so... We, you know, previous life I looked at one key adoption metric. So maybe um, you know, find out what is that key metric that really will determine if your product is going to be sticky um, with your particular customers. Great. Well, I think that's the only question that we got on um, from our from our viewers. Um, I'd like to thank everybody for their time and being a part of the first customer success hangout. Um, before I end, I will leave with the note that we did recently release a customer success benchmark report which talks about tools and challenges that customer success professionals are facing. So at the end of this event, I'm going to post it at the event page, and feel free to share it with your fellow customer success peers or just people within your company. So let's all say bye. Yay. Bye, thanks. Bye, guys.